Recently, there's been a, a big story that uh, there's been a suspension of operating licenses and new reactors in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit what's up with that? Yeah, yeah what's happened is the, um, the NRC made something called the Waste Confidence Rule. And they kind of arbitrarily decided that uh, it was perfectly acceptable to store nuclear waste above ground for as long as 100 years. Um, a group took them to court, and the court decided that they really hadn't proved their case and that uh, there wasn't enough evidence to support the waste confidence rule. So the NRC just had to, um, uh, had to punt and say, well, we've got to go over and redo the rule. Uh, in the meantime, until the rule is um, redone, um, they will um, not issue any new license extensions or not issue any new operating permits. Now, now that sounds pretty severe, but what they can do is they can waive their own uh, requirements individually and allow these plants to continue to operate. So they can say, well, we're... We're confident eventually we'll have confidence, so in the meantime we'll we'll just continue your old license, but we won't um, we won't give you um, we won't give you the new one, but you can operate anyway. So they uh, the, the old chairman, Chairman Yasko, who certainly wasn't uh, um, beloved by the industry, basically said that he thought within three or four years they'd have this thing straightened out and uh, they'd be back on track. So. I think the industry is looking at it as a speed bump, that they um, they think it may um, slow down a couple of reactors, but um, we're not going to be shutting reactors down in the meantime if the NRC has anything to do with it. And in San Onofre, they apparently removed some structural supports to add some tubes or some other things. How, how did that ever get authorized? Boy, that's a great question. This, at San Onofre... The um, old steam generator was uh, was was built in the in 1980s, and um, it had uh, served its useful life. And they wanted to replace it, so they went to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and they said, "We're going to replace it in kind with one that's just like it." Um, and uh, what happened was, it was nowhere near like the one they replaced it with. They put it in in 2010, and the second one in 2011 turned them on, and within 18 months, the tubes had rattled to the point where they uh, they pretty much destroyed the steam generators. So the units have been shut down now since, um, uh, since January and likely will remain shut down for a long time to come because they, um, they, they tried to um, come up with a modern design that had never been tried before, built by a vendor who had never built one of these before. And the net effect is uh, they've got a, a plant now that this is the single biggest accident near miss, the single biggest near miss in the nuclear industry since the davis Bessie reactor back in 2002. What happened there was a, a rust hole in the nuclear reactor almost broke through and would have caused a loss of coolant accident. Well, this one is the next worst to davis Bessie. Uh, they had eight tubes that were on the edge of failing, and, and had there been a steam line break, uh, they would have had an enormous release of radiation, much greater than they ever anticipated in their um, final safety analysis report. They would have had to um, evacuate a large portion of Southern California, and they would have had a meltdown. Uh, so we came close to a nuclear meltdown here at, uh, at San Onofre um, because these tubes were on the edge of, uh, of failing. Recently, RADnet and some of the other radiation detection networks have detected some, some big spikes in, uh, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, what could have caused that? I don't have, um, uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in, uh, in, in the data that's uh, that's taken by these RADnet um, sites. There's so much variability, and there's so many people that, that uh, with good intention may not have the right equipment, or um, you know there, there there could be many other scientific issues involved. So I, I really don't know what's going on out in Pennsylvania. Uh, okay, in in Canada there was. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the soaks meters and how do they exactly work? Because I spoke with a physicist who said that. Um, 
four comma two zero microsieverts is a negligible amount, but the the Soaks detectors say it's a dangerous radiation background. So how do we make sense of all that? Yeah, making sense out of radiation data is is a is a, is a tough job, and the um, uh, you really need to get this into a, a laboratory where the instrumentation is better than handheld. You know, for you and I to have a handheld device, it's a really good thing because it can give an early warning and know whether or not we're in jeopardy. But unless you've got a really good scientific device, you know, like like uh, we're using at Worcester Poly and, and, and other uh, institutions around the country. Um, raw data taken by civilians um, uh, really, uh, unless we can verify it in a, in a serious lab, yeah, I, I can't jump to conclusions about how, uh, how severe or how not severe the, uh, the information is. We're going to be putting up in the next week or so um, a video, a 15-minute video, that talks about just the level of detail that a scientist really needs to uh, uh, to do to um, uh, to do a to be confident in in the number. So when I see these numbers, I um, um, I, I, I it gets my attention, it gets my concern, but I don't um, I don't feel necessarily that's a good idea to broadcast it um, until I can verify it in the lab. Now, I remember you had mentioned that you were accepting samples for laboratory testing. How, how did that work out? We've been getting lab samples from uh, around the country, around the world, but, you know, especially the West Coast and more so, more importantly, in Japan now since, uh, since the Fairwind site went up over a year ago. And um, the, the, uh, uh, the data has been compiled. There's a bunch of scientific papers in the works. Um, you know, the, the one that's uh, most prominent right now is the one that Marco Kaltofen did at um, the American Public Health Association. And that was back in October of last year, so 10 months ago. And, and we saw that, um, uh, you know, air filters on cars, for instance, and kids' shoes, we're just loaded with cesium. So that number's been out there now for a year. But now we're seeing working with um, uh, people in Europe, a, a, a different group, um, we're focusing on dust, house dust. And we're asking people in Japan to send us their vacuum cleaner bags. And what we're finding, um, some of the bags are squeaky clean, which is great. And, and we tell the people that, and they can breathe a sigh of relief. But some of the bags are quite highly contaminated. We've got one bag from uh, out of about 80 miles away from the reactor that's got 100,000 um, 100, becquerels uh, per kilogram. So that means that a, a two-pound bag is, um, is giving 100,000 disintegrations every second. So that tells me that, uh, you know, the Japanese are not doing a very good job of informing the public about the ongoing public health issues for internal radiation. You know, they walk around with their handheld detectors, and if they're reading close to normal, everybody's happy. But the internal contamination in Japan is, is um, uh, I believe, significant and totally ignored by the Japanese government. Um, they could do a much better public health effort if they if they talk to people about vacuuming with high efficiency particulate filters, wet dusting, and things like that, because um, you know the the Japanese sleep on the floor. You know they roll mats out at night, and they're down with the dust, which we know to be contaminated. It was also really revealed that some of the contractors were, were removing some of their badges in order to maintain their um, profitability of their corporations. So this is this is probably a systemic thing, not a, in, not just from the government, but with the companies that they're working with. Uh, moving badges um, or, or removing badges or covering bag badges with uh, some sort of a protective uh, layer uh, is, is done all over the world. Um, as a matter of fact, you'll see in cases, uh, um, even in the United States, where, for instance, a welder uh, wants to complete a weld. So he'll keep his, his badge, 
but he won't keep it on his arm near the work. He may put it on his foot, which is uh, away from the work. And the, the net effect is that the uh, the badge underestimates the uh, the amount of exposure. Um, you know, there's been documented cases of uh, of leaving deliberately leaving badges behind uh, throughout the in, the industry, not just in Japan. So I was not surprised that um, that that some Japanese contractors got caught doing it. You know, they're lowering their exposure so they can make more money. You know, when they go off, um, go over the limit, they, they can't work anymore. So by keeping that badge uh, protected, they can work longer and um, and make more money. And unfortunately, Tokyo Electric is a worker shortage. And uh, so therefore, they're really not uh, policing this very well either. And what's the status right now of the, the removal of the rods? How did that go? And what's up with the fuel pools? Well, on Unit 4, they pulled two, um, uh, two rods from a reactor, uh, from the spent fuel pool, that were never in the nuclear reactor. So they were fresh nuclear fuel. Um, and they just wanted to see if they could do it. And, and they um, also began to sample the what materials in the rods to uh, to look for uh, you know, salt or to look for boron and things like that, just to get an idea of the chemicals that might be attached to the material. The, the actual nuclear fuel that's hot, um, physically hot and radioactively hot, is still under as much water as they could possibly keep it under and will likely be that way for at least another 18 months to come. Now, Ferens is going to have a, uh, a new video up on the whole issue of um, the, the spent fuel pool at Unit 4, um, and that should be coming up uh, you know, sometime between now and, and August 15th. We'll have that video up. It explains it in detail, but it is um, a very threatening situation. You know, we've, um, nuclear fuel can burn in air, and nuclear fuel... Um, in that pool has more cesium than was ever released in all the bombs that were um, dropped in uh, above ground testing um, for 40 years. And um, so if the fuel were to um, burn, and that would be caused by uh, an earthquake that cracks the pool, for instance, if that were to happen, Japan would be cut in half. And and likely contamination would, would circle the northern hemisphere, conceivably being really significant. You know, you, um, of course, we're out here where no science has gone before. No one's ever really even thought of, oh, my God, can a fuel pool catch fire? Um, so uh, we, we take a really hard look at that. We've got some never-before-seen video of, uh, uh, that, 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 that amplifies it. And my conclusion is... It's, um, it's really serious, and we need to get the fuel out of that pool just as quickly as possible um, because, you know, the next earthquake isn't going to wait until we're done. We've got to get it out before the next earthquake comes. And how do you evacuate Tokyo or Southern California? Well, I'm, I'm not <laughs> suggesting we're going to need to evacuate Southern California. I'm just California, saying hypothetically. But... Hypothetically, how would you it's, – it's impossible, I believe. I mean, you can't evacuate Tokyo or Southern California. It, it's impossible. So I think we need to really, really uh, keep monitoring this situation. Um, a, a question from some of our, uh, our, our, our team members. Has there ever been a follow-up study on the downwinders of Three Mile Island, like 20 years later? The best uh, follow-up study is by uh, uh, Dr. Steve Wing, and uh, uh, Wing gives a lecture on the Fairwinds website. Uh, so if you, you know, it's pretty searchable. If you look up uh, Steve Wing, um, comma Three Mile Island, or something like that, on the on our website, he's got a, a thirty-minute explanation of what happened to the downwinders at uh, at Three Mile Island. The problem is that there were no downwinders because there were no wind. There, it was a very calm day when the accident happened, and the radiation settled into the river valley. And when you uh, take a look at the data that, that Steve Wing has, it's crystal clear that the cancer rates in the river valley are, um, are higher than the, the cancer rates 
on the hilltops that are a couple miles away. So it, it, his, his analysis is peer-reviewed and it's uh, as solid as a rock.